ओम वसुदेव सुत देव कंसचाणोरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गु So this is our Bhagavad Gita class, and we are doing chapter eight. Um, if I remember correctly, in chapter eight, we had done the twenty-second verse. Is that right? We had done twenty-second verse, so we are on the twenty-third. We are going to start the twenty-third. A quick recap, <coughs> not recap, just a little bit of context here. this uh, part of the gita chapter uh, 7 8 9 10 11 12 these six chapters are about are primarily about god and devotion uh, ishwar or saguna brahman and bhakti um, remember that the structure which um, a non dualist an advaitin uh, sort of sees in the bhagavad gita 18 chapters divided into three sets of six chapters chapters 1 to 6 7 to 12 13 to 18 and uh, what how do you divide that the advaita idea that you and the ultimate reality are one in the same reality that which appears there's only one reality non dual reality brahman existence consciousness bliss and that appears as this entire universe as you the individual being and as the god of this universe so god the individual being and the universe all three there is an underlying reality the reality which is deeper than all of them something that is deeper or higher than the world than us individual sentient beings and then even even higher than god or deeper than god and that's brahman the non dual reality and advaita vedanta further says you the individual being you are that non dual reality uh, we are that non dual reality we are brahman but we don't uh, know it so, to be so and because we do not know it to be so that is the root of samsara that is the root of all suffering and our whole purpose whole goal is to become enlightened to this this ultimate reality about ourselves that we are brahman so that's the whole plot of advaita vedanta that's the story line now that's beautifully encapsulated in the statement famous statement tat tvamasi that thou art you are that ultimate reality and uh, the structure in the bhagavad gita is supposed to reflect this that thou art um, so the first six chapters are supposed to be an inquiry into who am i and, and we're supposed to discover that i am pure consciousness the next six chapters 7 to th- um, to 12 is an inquiry into that that means god and then the last six chapters from 13 to 18 are supposed to be to establish the identity of you and god how not that you are god that's uh, often uh, people make this mistake about non duality and that's why the dualistic uh, schools of vedanta charge us with blasphemy you know you think you are god <laughs> you're a miserable little creature and they would be right we as we know ourselves we are not god not at all it, it's ridiculous to claim that we are a very uh, very helpless little creatures we are we born and we are born and we die and we suffer we are ignorant we know very little um, but we vedanta claims that we are in reality if we would know ourselves we are that infinite reality which appears as the sentient being you and as god so therefore it is correct to say you and god are one reality not that the sentient being is god but rather the sentient being is brahman and brahman and god is also brahman so in that sense um but now and and how is this accomplished we all know we have been studying it so long that it is accomplished by an inquiry into ourselves i am not the body not the mind i am the witness consciousness and this witness consciousness is that infinite reality that's that's enlightenment and everything else um is um, an appearance the universe is an appearance in that absolute reality now the question arises is what about conventional religion where we uh, believe 
you know, a dualistic, theistic religion where we believe that God exists and heaven exists and uh, we establish a relationship with God. Where does that figure in all of this, in this uh, scheme of enlightenment, self-realization? So this is the context. The, the, what, what is going to happen now provides an answer to that question. Um, here we are not talking about self-inquiry, non-duality. We are just talking about God, devotion to God, you know, and what happens after death. That's the context. Uh, before I plunge into it, because the language here is going to be quite arcane. So before we get swept up by all those complexities, let me give you the big picture what Krishna is going to say. Um, Krishna is telling Arjuna that quite apart from his quest for enlightenment, self-realization, one should lead a devout life. So if one leads a devout life that I am devoted to God, in the form of Krishna or Vishnu or Devi, whatever, we are, come, we are entering into, um, the, into the worship of the Divine Mother, Durga. So that's another way in which we conceive of or worship God as um, God as the Mother. In whichever you conceive of God, whichever way you worship God, so have this loving, devotional relationship, worshipful relationship, dependence and surrender to God. And you do not want anything else in life. You don't want worldly pleasure, success and all that. So for such persons, what will happen to them? They lead ethical and devout lives while they are alive. And, at, and after death, what happens to them is that they go through the series of experiences and end up in the presence of God in heaven. Now, heaven here would refer to Brahmaloka. Remember, in the uh, Vedantic cosmology, there is a multiplicity of heavens. In fact, there are 14 worlds, seven of which are the good and bright ones, and seven are hellish. So there are 14 worlds. And the highest, the best of them is what is called, you know, heaven with a capital H in religion, where God dwells, God with capital G. So those who lead devout and worshipful lives and they are devoted to God and have bhakti, devotion, true devotion to God, they will end up in this capital H heaven, uh, in the uh, you know, Brahmaloka, which is called Vaikuntha in Vaishnavism, is called Kailasha or Shiva Loka in Shaivism, or Devi Loka in, um, you know, in Shakta traditions. Uh, and I would venture to say that's what's actually meant by the uh, Christian heaven or the Islamic heaven. Even the non-theistic religions, like for example, Buddhism speaks of a pure land, a kind of existence, um, very high existence. So that's what you will reach. This devout, worshipful person who has led an ethical and spiritual life throughout, not yet attained enlightenment. Maybe has not tried to, or maybe has tried but has not attained, has not realized I am Brahman. And having gone there, um, either they will never come back to this world and they will dwell there in the presence of God and attain to non-dual realization and eventual freedom from there. Or they might come back to this world, but they will be highly spiritual, highly evolved beings. Uh, Krishna has mentioned this in the sixth chapter. If you may be reborn here again and carry on your spiritual practices and attain enla full enlightenment, non-dual enlightenment. But in any case, you are blessed, you are safe. Uh, you'll be highly spiritual in this life, in the next, whatever. That's one path. This path will be called here the bright path, uh, uh, Shuklagati. And there are other names for it. Uh, Uttarayana. This is the path of the northern course. Uh, it is also known as Devayana, the path of the gods, the path which takes you to God. And then there is, in contrast, there is another path. Krishna will mention that. Um, and that path is, those who are religious, they may perform pujas, Vedic rituals, but they are primarily worldly. The whole point is, let me be happy, let my family do well, uh, let me be rich and healthy and prosperous. And for that, I am performing so many rituals, I am trying to keep you know, God on my side. For what? Not for attaining God. For the world. For a good life in this world and to go to heaven 
in the next world and then after that again attain a better life uh, so on that that's also a religious life that's also a religious life but not particularly spiritual such people who are steeped in in those days in vedic ritualism what would happen to them at the point of death uh, after death they will go through a path which krishna will call the uh, krishna gati here krishna gati does not mean krishna uh, of the gita it does not mean sri krishna it does not mean god krishna here just means dark and that's why krishna is called krishna actually he is supposed to be blue hued you know so uh, krishna gati here would mean the dark path in contrast to the bright path what is this dark path what does it consist in after death when one go through another series of experiences and end up in a heaven as i say a heaven and this heaven is small h heaven of which there are many such heavens you can have uh, you know all up there in the sky you can have economy class and what premium class and business class and first class all multiple heavens they're all heavens but remember all of those people whether you're in the first class or business class or premium or whatever i think so many names are there and or the economy class all of them will have to land they'll have to come back and land so similarly all of these heavens they are all wonderful places to be in but you will all come back that's why it's called the dark path it wants the you know the credit of your good karma the way the rituals the good credit and the karma you have earned that is exhausted the good merit of the merit of god is exhausted you come back to this world and again continue your life you come back to samsara you have not attained anything particularly spiritual so that's why it's called krishna gati or dark path um it's called dakshinayana the southern course uh, it's also called pitriyana the path of the forefathers so our forefathers who were noble people uh, who led righteous lives and uh, they fulfilled their obligations in, you know to the family to the community and were devout they paid their um, whatever they had to pay to the church or something and they did all of that so they will go by the path of the forefathers and end up depending on how good they were end up in one of those heavens have a good existence come back to samsara again reborn again and then what happens past karma they still have a lot of many lives karma that will take over and give them different kinds of births not all of which may be good so these are the two options open you might think wait a minute this is both of them are religious people right yes right suppose there's somebody there lots of people who are not at all religious who just live their lives some may be good some may be middling some may be pretty miserable you know, awful people what happens to them the vast majority a large number of people who may not be particularly moral or religious well for them it is uh, that just after death the past karma takes over and gives them some kind of birth no question of the higher realms or one of those heavens and not even economic class you just you just go by you know amtrak or something like that um uh, and um uh, so this this is what is going to be said now remember neither the um the shukla gati that is the bright path or the krishna gati the dark path or the people who are just you know who have no interest in religion uh, who will be who will die and will will, will be for the force of the past karma will be reborn again so none of these three uh, are enlightened what happens to the enlightened that is not mentioned here that's not the subject here at all and i'll just mention here that before i go into this uh, this though it is not directly related to the core the heart of vedanta the realization that i am brahman it's not directly related to that but it's important nevertheless that uh, it's stressing that a devout life uh, with some amount of ritual um, devotion to god prayer surrender to god and a dispassion for worldliness not not being too worldly not being greedy lustful uh, angry um, uh, you know not nurturing negativities that is very important even if one is not non dualistic is not trying to get enlightenment 
it's very important for one's further uh, growth and for a better life. So that that's a very it's a wise thing. Even if you're not non-dualistic, even if you're not a you know, follower of you know, trying to realize I am Brahman, you are not doing Vedantic inquiry. Doesn't matter. It's still a good thing to do at least this much. And this is a lot. It's it's a very uh, ethical and religious lifestyle. So this is what this is the topic. Why did I give all this detailed introduction? Because you will see the terms used are uh, rather confusing. Uh, they are they because they are borrowed from ancient Vedic terms, uh, which have very technical meanings. Now, twenty third verse. Yatra kale tvana vrittim avrittim chaiva yoginaha prayata yantitam kalam vakshami bharatar shabha. O best of the Bharatas, the time at which departing from hence the yogis attain non return or return, that time I shall tell you. He's using the language of time, the time of death, but it's actually not time. It's the kind of life one leads and the path, path by path, I don't mean an actual physical path through space. It's a series of experiences which he will mention, but what will happen after death. So the kind of life one leads, is it a devout, ethical, devout life or a ritualistic, conventionally religious life? These are the two he's going to talk about. About the third one who's not at all interested in religion and maybe leads an unethical life, he's not talking about that person at all here. And he's not talking about the other one, the enlightened one, the Jivan Mukta also here. The moment, how do you know? The moment you talk about going and coming, it means the person is not enlightened. Going somewhere is an experience of the unenlightened person. The enlightened person knows I neither come nor go. I am Brahman. I am the infinite. Where will the infinite go? All right. So what is said here? Yatra Kale means at what time, at which time. And it does not mean time here. That's one in, in interesting thing to learn. It means the kind of life you lead, the path you are following, that. So that path, that kind of life, which leads to non-return. Non-return means you go and live um, in the presence of God in Capital H heaven, Vaikuntha, Shiva Loka, or you know, we, we say Ramakrishna Loka, for example, in, in our order. It all means the same place. It's called Brahma Loka. The, uh, it's a realm, a highly spiritual realm. You dwell in the presence of God. Avrittimcha, or there will be return. Here, return means the second path. Moral, ritualistic person, person but wants, you know. Uh, uh, happiness in this world and the next world. That person will come back. Why? Because he wanted it. He or she wanted it. That will come back. So that path. So you, both are, he's calling both yogis. But one is actually a devout worshipper, meditator on God. The other one is a ritualistic kind of yogi. Prayata, having departed in this life after physical death of the body. Yanti, they go. Tankalam bhakshami bharata shava. That time or that path I will speak of now. Now what is he going to talk about? Let's see. So here come all those a shower of arcane uh, terms. Agni Jyotir Aha Shukla Shanmasa Uttarayanam Tatra Prayata Gachanti Brahma Brahma Vido Janaha Fire, the flame, the day, the bright half of the month, and six months of the sun's northern course, departing by this path, the knowers of Brahman attain Brahman. All right. First off, Agni means fire, but here it does not mean fire. It means the Devata or a deity who, uh, who is the deity of fire, a god of fire. Um, light. It does not mean light as such. It means another deity. Day. It does not mean day. It means a deity who is called day. Um, Shukla Sanmasa Uttarayana. It's another deity who is associated with this time uh, of the six months of the sun's northern course. So they all refer to 
deities they all refer to gods uh, but not god with capital g what does this mean there are reports actually uh, of um, you know people who have had near death experiences and then have come back to tell us so i take it seriously or not but the reports are interesting they often speak of a bright being being approached by a bright being who is calling to them so these are what are mentioned here uh, that the after death the sentient being uh, you we we, we will uh, come in contact or will be approached by this, like some kind of heavenly guides they will take us you know all within quotes take us to another realm and hand us over to the next guide and the next guide will take us to that and so on so these are all the um, the heavenly guides which are mentioned here they are deities uh, and how do i know this because literally if you translate literally it means fire flame day uh, bright half of the month six months of the uh, sun's northern course and so on so how do i know these mean deities or or the gods with small g uh, well thanks to shankaracharya's uh, uh, you know commentary and all the classical commentaries and the reason they give this commentary is that this is not new or unique to the bhagavad gita such terms they are all borrowed from the upanishads from the vedas in the chandogya upanishad in the brihadaranyaka upanishad these things are mentioned the way of the Uh, of the gods devayana this is what is being mentioned the way of non return into samsara or the way of the forefathers pitriyana the way of return back into samsara uh, so it is found in the upanishads these are and these are deities uh, in the upanishad deity not god small g god heavenly beings um, spiritual beings the radiant beings who help the departing soul on their path Uh, for example let me read shankaracharya's little bit of his commentary you will get the flavor of how he tries to explain this difficult uh, portion or arcane portion agni literally means fire agni kala abhimani ni devata so this is a devata a god small g god who is uh, who presides over time and it doesn't mean fire jyoti api devata eva kala abhimani ni and then um jyoti means here not light literally it means light but it may here it means a, a, a divine being a devata who is identified with a particular stage in the um, the departed soul's journey and that person takes that divine being takes over and so on uh, and then uh, he goes on to say all of these terms they refer to devatas um, individual deity small g gods and then what happens tatra prayata passing along this path going along this path the who 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 are we talking about not everybody brahma vido janah brahmavit here means knower of brahman here it does not mean knower of brahman it means the one who has meditated upon brahman meditated upon god who has prayed to god who has a devotional relationship with god look if you want to put say forget all this complicated stuff just tell me straight away what does this mean it means what all the the dualistic religions devotional religions tell you if you are devoted to god god after death you go to heaven that's what it means that's all that it means here uh, just series of mystical experiences you have one after another and as i said these have been reported by uh, people with near death experiences those who sort of have this experience and come back to tell us they report a little bit of this and it's some somehow common to many religions um, it may not be described at all in this language but all religions speak of heavenly guides or beings who help um, take take the departing soul to to the presence of god where do they go brahma gachanti they are, they go to god 
here they go to God means they go to heaven and dwell in the presence of God. So literally what uh, theistic, dualistic religions promise. If you are a believing, devout person, you will reach uh, God. Whether it is in uh, Christianity, Islam, in Vaishnavism, in um, you know, Shaivism, uh, in every theistic religion. You, you, that is what is promised after death. Basically, that's what he's talking about. And this is good. This is a good path. That's why it's called Shuklagati, a bright path. In contrast to that, he will talk about the other path of people who are not bad people. But basically, they are believing people also. But their, whole, their, their entire belief is uh, oriented towards the world. They want this world. And they, take, they enlist God's help for this world. And you'll find most people who go to temples, churches, mosques, they basically want God's help for this world. So such people, they will get this world. After death, they will attain to heaven, one of those lower heavens, and come back again into this world. And that's not bad. Remember, that's a much more pleasant experience than uh, outright worldly people who have no interest in religion, who uh, just you know, drift in life, and they will be taken over, overtaken by their past karma, and they will attain to various other births. That's, that can entail a lot of suffering. These are not people who will suffer. The second group, which is coming up now, they will not suffer. They will, in fact, have very pleasant experiences after death. But the only thing is, they will have to come back into samsara until they attain to spirituality. So that's the second path. Dhuma Ratri Tatha Krishna Shanma Sadakshinayanam Tatra Chandra Masam Jyoti Yogi Prapya Nivartate smoke, the night, the dark half of the month, and the six months of the sun's southern passage. Departing by this path, the yogi attains the lunar sphere and returns thence. Again, all symbolic language, which we wouldn't make any sense of. I mean, what's all this smoke, night, and it's talking about the dark half, the lunar calendar, you know, the dark fortnight, uh, and then the uh, six months of the sun's southern uh, passage. Yeah. By the way, we all know what it means, northern passage, southern passage. I mean, we all see the sun rising in the east and setting in the west. But if you observe the heavenly movement you know, from, the, from our perspective in the earth, the sun doesn't uh, rise and set exactly in the same spot all the time throughout the year. There is a distinct movement northward or southward across the uh, year. So that's what is meant here. And here it does not mean that at all. Here it means deities, whom this person, this second kind of person, uh, after death will meet in uh, it, his or her spiritual in a, a journey after death and attain to some particular heaven. And who are those deities? And those deities are called, the deity associated with called dhumas, or maybe a smoky deity, who knows, um, ratri, uh, night, and then... It, this is called Krishna Paksha, the dark path. Dark only because you'll have to come back. Dark only because at the end of all of this, samsara is there again. Uh, but it's still a very pleasant path because it is a person who uh, has been uh, ethical and has been has performed rituals, regular you know, puja or whatever rituals are prescribed in your religion, has been basically a conventionally religious person. And basically a good person, a good citizen in, in community. So such a person will have a good time of it after death, but again come back to samsara. This is called the so-called dark path. Other names are um, the Pitriyana, the path of the forefathers. This is the path by which our forefathers have gone. And they obviously are back to samsara somewhere, in some form, somewhere. Um, so these are the two paths. And remember, this, this terminology is Upanishadic. Chandogya Upanishad, Brihadarnya Upanishad. They have these references. Another different take on this matter is, and a pretty detailed study is found in Tibetan Buddhism, where they have a very, um, very fine-grained analysis of what happens exactly after death for a non-enlightened person. So they call it the bardos. So 
there is a Tibetan book of the dead. Uh, so very, very famous, a classic. That has sections on this kind of thing. Not in this language, some other uh, uh, analysis. But yes, there are bright beings, there are stages. Then number 26. Shukla Krishna Gati Hete Jagata Shashwate Mate Ekaya Yatyana Vrittim Anyaya Vartate Punaha. These two paths of the world, the bright and the dark, are considered to be eternal. By one, one returns not, and by the other, one returns. Basically, summing up all of this, these are two possible paths by which. Um, a religious person might what what would happen to a believing person, a religious person after death. Uh, one both are good. One will lead to the highest heaven, the presence of God, as promised in your particular religious path, and you will have those experiences, and it will be a blessed experience. And even the Advaitin, the non-dualist like us, uh, our uh, point is also satisfied because the point is that there in that highest heaven, those who have not got enlightenment in this life, who were maybe not paying attention in the Vedanta classes, uh, uh, they, they will, again, I'm sure, have Vedanta classes there in the highest heaven. And then God is a hard taskmaster. He'll make sure you pay attention and become enlightened in that highest heaven. So non-dual knowledge also will be there. So uh, the, the demand of the non-dual is that you will not get, you will not be free until you realize you are Brahman, you are one with the infinite. And that also will happen there. Or the other one, where one goes to some kind of heaven, has a good time, comes back again, and samsara goes on. Ekaya, by one, by the northern path, by the bright path, by the path of the devas. Uttarayana, um, Shuklagati, Devayana, by that path. Anavikti, it's the path of non-return. And the other one, Avartate Punaha, the dark path, which is Krishna Gati, the path of the forefathers, which is uh, Pitriyana, the path of um, the southern course, Dakshinayana, the southern course of the sun, one comes back. Then, and it, what does he mean eternal? This is, this is the way of samsara. As long as one is in samsara, this is true. This will happen to us. But again, from an Advaitic perspective, this is not the ultimate truth. The ultimate truth is this is all part of a movie, an appearance. You realize you are Brahman, you are free of all this complication. <laughs> then 27. Naite sriti partha janan yogi muhyati kaschana tasmat sarve shukaleshu yoga yukto bhavarjuna. Knowing these paths, O Partha, no yogi is deluded. Therefore, at all times, O Arjuna, be endowed with yoga. So, What is this importance of this knowledge? If we know this is what's going to happen to us, uh, let's, at, at the very minimum, of course, we should all try to be enlightened in this very life. But at the very minimum, one should not scoff at uh, conventional religion. There's a lot of wisdom packed into it. Especially if you want your good hereafter, in this life and hereafter, um, devotion to God and uh, uh, you know, an ethical life is very important. Conclusion, Krishna says, Tasmat Sarveshu Kaleshu Yoga Yukto Bhava Arjuna. Therefore, at all times, uh, keep God in mind. Yoga Yukta means be centered in yoga. But what yoga has been talked about here? Devotion to God. So continuously try to remember God day and night. Keep your mind on God. Keep your heart set on God. And let your prayers go out to the Lord. Here he is referring back to what he had taught at the beginning of the chapter. And that um, if you think of God at the point of death, then you will attain to God. That is the first path, the bright path, that you will get if you hold on to God uh, at the point of death. But then he says, how do you hold on to God at the point of death? Who knows? Where is the guarantee? So the guarantee is that if you then you have to hold on to God uh, throughout your life. Make a habit 
morning and evening meditation um, and, and keeping your mind on God throughout the day, dedicating your actions to God. All could be done privately in, in the privacy of your heart. Nobody need know about it. In fact, that's the best form of devotion. So that one must Very conventional, um, dualistic, theistic religion. And Krishna gives his full approval to it. So the basic point here is, smart sarveshu kaleshu yoga yukto bhava arjuna. At all times, that means under all conditions, whether you are in meditation or in puja, or you are working or relaxing, at all times, keep your mind on God. We have heard this again and again from the great swamis like Shivananda, Brahmananda, from the Holy Mother, and of course, Sri Ramakrishna, Vivekananda. The essential thing is to keep your mind on God. And the mind will mind means also heart. Heart means what I want, and mind means what I'm thinking about. I can always say, oh, I want God. But if I'm honest, I find that I'm not thinking about God at any time throughout the day. Or I can make the train the mind to mechanically you know, repeat a mantra or uh, you know, do a series of practices throughout the day. But the heart may not want it. The heart may be pretty wor worldly. So both are necessary. Keep your heart on God. That means I want or try to uh, focus your energies, your desires Godward and keep the attention on God. Mind is attention on God. And then number 28. He concludes this chapter. Vedeshu yagyeshu tapasu chaiva Daneshu yat punya phalam pradishtam Atyeti tat sarvam idam viditva Yogi param sthanam upeti chadyam A nice uh, like advertisement come conclusion for this chapter. He says, what does he say here? Whatever good result is declared regarding study of the Vedas, regarding the Vedic sacrifices, regarding ascetic performances, you know, like um, fasting and uh, an austere life, and charity, giving gifts. All of these are praised in the um, scriptures as good deeds. All of them, whatever result they can give, just this practice which has been mentioned in this chapter, just knowing this, that means keeping your mind on God. This exceeds all of those practices by far. If you keep your mind on God, keep your heart on God, then it's far greater than all the good deeds like being charitable, like being you know fasting regularly or um, chanting the Vedas or performing rituals. All those are good, but higher than them is just this practice of keeping your mind on God. Is just holding on to God uh, in your attention, giving your heart to God, dedicating your actions to God, basically leading a God-centered life um, day after day. That's the highest spiritual practice. Nothing comes close to it. So he, he concludes the chapter with this uh, verse. Um, Vedeshu, that means in the Vedas or chanting of the Vedas, Yajna, performance of the Vedic uh, sacrifices. Tapaha, various austerities, staying awake at night, um, uh, fasting, uh, you know, re re repeating mantras for hours and hours. Daneshu, uh, dana means charitable uh, activities, um, giving in charity. Yat punya phalam, whatever good karma comes out of it, whatever is uh, indicated in the scriptures that all this gives rise to good karma. Atyeti, far exceeded. Um, this one-pointed devotion to God, it exceeds all of this by far. That sarvamidam, uh, all of this, these practices are um, exceeded by far. The one who knows this truth, that you have to keep your mind on God. All right. Now, we have completed the eighth chapter. Just a few words on the 8th chapter and then we'll look at the questions. So, in the 8th chapter, Arjuna asks seven questions at the very beginning. And all those questions are about terms which Krishna mentioned at the end of the 7th chapter. 
Kim tad brahma, I'm reading the first verse of the eighth chapter, which we just did. Kim tad brahma, kim adhyatmam, kim karma, purushottama, adi, adibhutam cha, kim proktam, adidaivam, kim uchyate. So what is brahman? Uh, what is adhyatma, the inner spiritual reality? Karma, what is karma? Uh, what is this material word, adibhutam? Uh, what is the world of deities, of, of the small g's, heavens? Adibdaivam, uh, kimuchyate. And then, adhyagya katham kotra, second verse. Dehasmin purusha madhusudana. Dehasmin madhusudana. Prayani kalecha katham geosi niyatatma bhi. The sixth and seventh question. Adhyagya, who? What is the truth about all these spiritual practices we perform? To whom is it going? And then the last question, which is really the theme of the whole chapter. What do we do at the time of death? At the point of death, it's, it's very important. And what do we do? Um, at the point of death, how do we know the truth? How do we die, basically? I, I remember this interesting story about a duke in Europe, I think France or somewhere, who met Swami Vivekananda and he asked the Swami, what can you teach me? And Swami Vivekananda said, I can teach you how to die. So it doesn't mean how to commit suicide. It means uh, what is the most glorious uh, spiritual way of leaving this world, where you can leave this world smiling. This chapter, it tells you really how one should prepare for death. And then we know the answers. We, we studied it. All the first six questions are answered quickly in two verses by Krishna. He says, um, Brahman is the ultimate reality, the indestructible ultimate reality of this universe. Aksharam Param Brahma, the trans transcendental, indestructible reality, Akshara, un un unchangeable reality. That's why this whole chapter is called Akshara Brahma Yoga. Uh, so, uh, Brahman is the ultimate reality. That's all. He doesn't say anything more about it. And then, what is Adhyatma, our inner spiritual reality? He says, pure consciousness. You are consciousness. You are Atman. That's your inner spiritual reality. And then, um, what is Karma? Karma is cause and effect. That which produces this entire universe. That which regulates everything. Causality. Every action has its uh, effect. Every uh, cause you know, has its consequence. Then, um, Adibhutam, what is this material universe? It's made of the five elements, space and fire, or air and fire and uh, water and earth and combinations of those five elements. We have a much more um, scientific description of all the elements in the world today. This material universe, that's, it's material elements, combinations of those, that's this material universe. And then the... Adi Daivatam. So all the um, deities taken together, small g gods taken together, is the world of the gods. I'll tell you later what it means. Then Adi Yagya. He says, to whom do all the rituals go, the, the effects of the rituals, whom are we worshipping? Uh, he says, it is me, God. I am Ishwar. I am being worshipped in all rituals. Krishna says this. Basically, by these three terms, Adhibhuta, Adhidaiva, and Adhiyagya, those who have followed Vedanta carefully, you will notice he has cleverly inserted the three aspects of the divine. One is Virat, one is Hiranyagarbha, one is Ishwara. So that one consciousness with the entire universe as its body is called Virat. That's God. That's God in the physical manifestation of this universe. And uh, just as a side note here, to those who have studied theology, it's not pantheism. It's not that God is this physical universe. A closer term, which, I, which is more popular nowadays, is called panentheism. So panentheism is, God is sort of reflected in this material universe. That is called Adibhuta. And Adidaiva is, the, the, all, the cosmi, all the minds taken together, the subtle bodies taken together, Hiranyagarbha, consciousness associated with all subtle bodies is uh, Hiranyagarbha. That's what's referred to as Adhidaiva. And then consciousness 
with the power of Maya, God, Ishwara, the God of religion, that is called Adhiyagya here. Just as we have three levels of our being, you are pure consciousness, Atman, that's what you are. Uh, but with, you know, in deep sleep, pure consciousness associated with the causal body, is that what we experience in deep sleep? In dreams, pure consciousness associated with causal body and the mind, the dreaming mind. That's how we experience ourselves. And in the waking state, you, the pure consciousness, limited one by one causal body and one subtle body and one um, physical body or gross body is how we experience ourselves. And corresponding to that is that same pure consciousness with all causal bodies taken together, which is Maya, is Ishwara. The same pure consciousness with all subtle bodies, all causal bodies plus all subtle bodies taken together is Hiranyagarbha. The same pure consciousness with all causal bodies, all subtle bodies and all physical bodies taken together is Virat or Vishwarupa is what is Krishna, what Krishna showed Arjuna uh, or is going to show in the 11th chapter. Vishwarupa Darshana. Anyway, that's just if, you, if it's confusing for you um, then just let it be. But those who have done Vedanta Sara, it will be, it just matches it so, so well. The rest of the um, chapter is focusing on that at the point of death, do remember God. And in order to re remember God, remember God at the point of death, then you remember God throughout your life, throughout your days. He says that Antakalecha Mame Vasmaran Muktva Kalevaram. At the point of death, think of me and let and be delivered from this body. Let go of this body. Why? Yangyam vapi smaran bhavam tyajatyante kalevaram. It says, whatever you think of, whatever you dwell on at the time of death, that will influence what will happen to you after death. Therefore, dwell on God. Dwell on the highest. I know of people. I know this person who died was a generally a good person you know, in our family before I became a monk. And uh, her last thought, uh, her last expression before she died of cancer was that where she had hidden some money you know, so that her family could use it. That's what... Uh, you're thinking about that at the point of death. You can't help it. You know? that, that's the most important thing when dominant thoughts come up. Regrets come up. Um, or in Reader's Digest, one nurse who, was, who had done palliative care for many years of her life. So she wrote a very touching article of you know, people who die, they're conscious at the point of death. Some die in unconsciousness, but some die with consciousness. What do they talk about at the last moment of their life? Many of them talk about regrets, especially regrets of not having done, very important, not having followed their dreams. There's something that they really wanted to do in their lives and then humdrum you know, life events took over and they didn't do it. Um, so they regretted that at the point of death. Um, but whatever we dwell on at the point of death, that has a powerful effect on what happens to us in, after death. Now someone may ask, but isn't the whole point of the law of karma is our past karma will determine what will happen to us after death, next life. What does it matter what we think about at the point of death for just for a few moments? Well, the idea of the law of karma is we have a vast storehouse of karma. We don't know what's there. So what will be unpacked? It's Krishna seems to be saying that part of your karma will be unpacked, which, you are, which corresponds to what you are dwelling on. So it's always good to dwell on something positive, high, especially spiritual at the point of death. And Krishna is very clear. Tasmat sarveshu kaleshu. This is verse number seven. Tasmat sarveshu kaleshu. Ma manusmara yudhyacha. Mayar pita mano buddhi. Ma ve vaishyasin asamshaya. He says, therefore, the upshot of all this, and this might be the one verse which sums up the entire chapter. Therefore, at all times, that means under all conditions, whatever is going on in your life, ma manusmara, think of me. Think of me. Remember me. Remember God. And yudhyacha. And fight the battle of life. It's interesting. Don't be disengaged from life. Uh, you know, this is quite interesting that 
all the religions, the highest spiritual teachings, they always include the highest spirituality and the world also. Nothing is excluded. Jesus in the New Testament, he says, it's the highest teaching. He says that um, love, you know, the great the commandment. What's the one commandment we should remember? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy might. What a beautiful commandment. He says, that's the most important. Then he adds, and, and, love thy neighbor. So the world is not excluded. Your life in the world is not excluded. Uh, he, he is both, uh, he's including. Transcendence and immanence. It's not that there is uh, God only in heaven and there's nothing else here. This is... Uh, an ungodly place. No, if you exclude the world, you're making a mistake. This is where non-duality comes from. The non-duality says there's this one reality. What you find, Sri Ramakrishna put it this way, the God you find with eyes closed, the same God you find with eyes open. So, Ma Manusmara Yudhyacha. Krishna says the same thing. That dwell on me, remember me, and fight the battle of life. Whatever you have to do, that you do in the light of, you know, in the presence of God. In this way, Mai Arpita Mano Buddhi, having dedicated your mind at your attention, your thoughts to me, and Buddhi, your understanding to me, your heart to me, you will attain to me this Asamshaya. He gives a guarantee here, the stamp of you know, like a divine guarantee. Without any doubt, you will attain to God. Right. Let me look at the comments quickly before we wrap up. Uh, Aditya says, what does capital mean? When you say heaven with capital H, God with capital G, the philosophical difference between capital uh, God and versus lowercase God, yes, there is. So, um, in Hinduism, we talk of devatas. Literally, it means the bright ones, the bright beings. And they are not God. They are like sentient beings like us. They have attained to a high status. They are powerful beings. Um, they dwell in some heavenly realm. And they control the forces of nature. They control the forces in our bodies also. But they are not God. And they are not enlightened. And so just because of a great deal of good karma, they may have attained to certain positions. And they will lose it after some time. And they will come back into this samsara. And we too can attain to those positions. But they are it's otherworldly, but still worldly. It's nothing particularly highly spiritual about them. So these are the gods which we hear about in uh, Hindu mythology. Uh, Indra, Chandra, Varuna, Agni and all of that. Right. But God, capital G. So these are English words. In um, Sanskrit, Ishwara, Bhagavan. It's very clear. Saguna Brahman uh, is the creator, preserver, destroyer of the universe. Is the controller of our destiny. The giver of the fruits of our karma. Is the one to whom our worship is directed. Is the one who loves and looks after us and protects us and guides us to enlightenment and freedom. Uh, Ishwara, the omnipotent, omniscient, um, omnipresent. Yeah. And uh, there is only one of that. Only one God. And that God actually projects this entire universe out of his, her or its own existence. That's basically the God of religion. Of theistic religions. That is God with capital G. Because of this distinction is not understood. Often Hinduism is thought of as a polytheistic religion. You know, multiple gods and you know, they worship many a bunch of different gods. That's fine if you think about it that way. But it's actually not true. Uh, Hinduism is very clear that there is one power in this universe. And it goes further. Um, further than the monotheistic religions. In Swami Vivekananda said, here in the United States. I'm afraid your monotheism, so-called much wanted monotheism, is but halfway house. It's not a complete system. And go even further. That is Advaita, non-dualism. It's not that there is a universe and there are sentient beings and above us somewhere there is one supreme, you know, all-powerful dictator of the universe ruling over all of us. Not like that. There is one underlying reality of all of this, which is appearing as many. Anyway, 
but it's also true that this god of religion is a reality it's not a fiction and this one god that's the capital g god that's the god you would worship and that god can be worshiped in different forms and different names in hinduism now we are going to worship the same god as mother in durga puja this week by the way those who are here in new york you can come for the puja on sunday morning um but the same god is worshiped as shiva is worshiped as vishnu it's the same one god the name is different forms are different mantras are different rituals are different stories are different it's, it's, but one some things are common that it's one power who controls the entire universe who uh, projects maintains and dissolves the universe who is omniscient omnipotent all loving beneficial uh, so those characteristics are common across all of these and uh, this is the same god that jews christians muslims they all worship as the one power behind this universe the one loving uh, you know father of this universe so that's the capital g god small g gods many and they are all like people like sentient beings in charge of different powers of this universe you can think of them like we have dc comics and marvel comics and superheroes and so a variety of supernatural beings okay not spiritually important similarly heaven so after that we do exist but these are called lokas or planes of existence there are multiple planes of existence why after that even now we do exist and we live in a particular loka this is the mortal plane called martya loka so this is one plane of existence but after the death of this body there will be other planes of existence those are all called small h heavens the there are good ones and there is the highest heaven brahma loka which is a spiritual heaven because that's where you 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 are dwelling in the presence of god capital g so a devout a devotional person would aim to reach that that's what's promised in religions when be a good person believing person you go to heaven even krishna here in the 8th chapter has said that that's the highest heaven but there are lower uh, i mean not even earths were mortal worlds or heavens there are miserable worlds worlds of darkness and despair and suffering those are hells uh, it's not right to say that in uh, hinduism there is no hell people uh, sometimes think that that's what vivekananda said no 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 there are there's not not just one hell there are multiple hells there are uh, seven hells which are described in um, in vedanta for example in jainism in buddhism the descriptions of multiple hells so it is a part of uh, indian culture but the only thing is none of these are permanent you don't burn in hell forever nor do you go to one of these lower heavens forever though the highest heaven is truly forever but all of these others this mor- mortal world uh, the lower heavens and the hellish worlds they are all temporary a lot of bad karma will take us to the uh, hells a lot of good karma will take us to the lower heavens and mixed karma always brings us back to this world so that's the difference between god with small g god with capital g in sanskrit the devatas and ishwar or bhagavan that's the difference so charles chow is saying where are the uh, good and bad in the karma stored and transferred in the i read that karma is not linked or contained in the atman right karma is not has nothing to do with the atman the effects of karma the tendencies are there in the subtle body and the results of karma are always stored with god just like your funds your credit and debit everything is stored in the bank and the bank manager um, gives you a line of credit or pulls in your debts whenever they want similarly uh, our karma account is uh, is controlling what happens to us in this life and the next yes the story of bhishma neela neela ji bill they're all talking about this yeah so that their time the six month journey of the sun to the not literally it is true and remember i'm giving an interpretation of this um from the commentaries of shankara acharya but if you literally take what krishna is saying it seems to be time uh, one part of the year if you die in that part of the year you go to the highest heaven if you die in the other part of the year you go to the uh, world of the forefathers both are by the way good 
Rick says some people routinely perceive these subtle beings even without having an NDE. Yes, there are mystical experiences of these beings. Mm. And there are de depictions of people experiencing these gods, these small g gods. Literally, look at the word devata. Devata, div means shine. So there are some shining beings. Padma says, as a strong believer of God, after he took away my child, it's being very difficult to understand how to accept his actions and worship him. Yeah, uh, everything in this world, giving and taking is, uh, is karma, is cause and effect, impersonal. It's not that there is a being out there who is punishing us. That's very difficult to accept. If there's a being out there who's punishing us and rewarding us, that's a bit infantile. But if it's all cause and effect, then maybe one can come to some kind of reconciliation. But something like losing a child is, is so traumatic and so deep. I was reading somewhere. Notice, there are words in all languages for people who lose say, a husband or a wife, you know, a widower or a widow, or, or lose parents, an orphan. There is no word for somebody who's lost a child. So that's so, so uh, devastating. And at that point, it's difficult to believe in a loving God. Still, we do sur survive and we go on with life. And even afterwards, there are uh, pleasures and pains. And it might sound cruel, but even after such a terrible shock, we do go to sleep. And when we sleep, we forget everything including the most terrible shock of all. And when we wake up, when we even are remembering such sorrows, even then, loss of a child may be the most traumatic and sorrowful thing. Even that most traumatic and sorrowful, the greatest of griefs, that you don't remember continuously. You'd go mad if somebody remembered it. It comes and goes. Thomas says, if there's only Brahman, then... Are the gods and other spiritual beings in their own right? They merely manifest. All are manifestations of Brahman. They're merely manifestation. Does that mean the gods in the Vedas, Upanishad, Puras are just Brahman interacting with itself? Yes. From a non-dual perspective, there's only one reality. Now, interacting with itself, when you talk about interaction, like we are interacting with each other. So it's much better to describe it as sentient beings interacting with each other. But what is the truth of all of this? The truth of all of this is there is one underlying being which is shining forth as all of this. Lisa says, it sounds like the three Ishwara, Virat and Brahman are comparable to Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Um, better not compare that. <laughs> These are very... Uh, theologically loaded terms, a lot of complex theology behind it. So we can just leave it just like that. I mean, people have compared Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwara to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But again, I don't think that's a, a good comparison because the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in Christianity, Father would be uh, Saguna Brahman, Ishwara, or Bhagavan of, uh, of Hinduism. That I agree. But the Son here would mean incarnation, avatar. That also is compatible. But the idea of Holy Ghost, the presence of God amidst all of us, that's a conception not directly found in, uh, in Vedanta. Sukriti. Is Brahman and Atman the same? Yes, that's the Advaitic idea. Atman means our own reality. Brahman means the reality of this universe or God. They are the same ultimately because it's all existence consciousness place. If you follow a dualistic religion, then they are not the same. You are an individual being. You have an immortal soul. You can call it the Atman, but that Atman is not Brahman. Brahman is God who is separate from your Atman. It's a dualistic approach. In Advaita Vedanta, they are literally the same ultimately. But at this, so that's by two levels of truth. Ultimate truth, Brahman and Atman are the same. At the level of... Um, uh, relative truth, transactional truth, which we are living in, basically we are interacting in you know, this virtual reality we are living in. Their differences are there. You can clearly see there's a difference between us and God. Therefore, Krishna can tell us, keep thinking about God. He's not saying that um, you are God, so keep thinking about yourself. 
and we can happily say, yeah, that's what I do all the time. I keep thinking about myself all the time. No, that's not what he means. He says, you are individual beings, sentient beings. Think about God, love God, and you and God are not the same in, uh, at this level. So that uh, one level, uh, that is Advaita, that self-knowledge that was taught in the second chapter and third chapter and so on. But this here, devotion to God is being mentioned. Here, the difference is emphasized. Ramya says, Buddhi being convinced would inevitably lead to Manas being convinced to. No, Buddhi is convinced. Buddhi means understanding. So, understanding requires conviction, clarity. And Manas means thoughts. We have a series of thoughts coming and going. That requires focus. Each thought should be directed to God. I might be quite totally convinced. Yes, I'm convinced. God is real. Self-knowledge is required. Spirituality is great. I want to be spiritual. I want to be enlightened. I want to be devotional. But what do I do actually throughout my days? Am I really paying attention to God? No. I'm concerned with so many other things in the world. Mostly my days are passing in sort of you know, thinking about the world and people, good thoughts, bad thoughts. That means the manas, the mind, is engaged with the world. Though we are claiming, I have understood God realization is the ultimate, God exists. So one must take care of both. That clarity, understanding, determination must be there. My, I am a spiritual seeker. My goal is God realization. God does exist. That's buddhi. And the mana says, continuously, moment to moment, day to day, as much as possible, think about God. Love, pray, worship God, repeat the mantra. So, uh, the two have to be done separately. One is not enough. Shammade Chaudhary says, how do we keep our mind and heart on God? What is the difference between the two? Yes, I just explained that. Skipped over iPad at 8.16. Where is iPad? Oh, how do you remember God at the time of death when you're unconscious or in extreme pain? What happens then? Yes, that's why only, only way out is, um, as Krishna said, sarveshu kaleshu ma manusmara. As much as possible throughout our days, keep your mind on God. Otherwise, it's not possible at the time of death, time when the mind is very weak. The mind is um, tortured by the pain in the body. And when the mind slips into unconsciousness, you cannot remember God. But just before you slip into unconsciousness, and remember one thing, more than this, I mean, this is like creating a lot of pressure on people. Oh God, I have to think about God all the time. Remember, it does not matter. It, it's not dependent on our efforts, really. This thinking about God and loving God expresses our yearning for God. But what happens after death and what we attain to, that's all in the hands of God. Even this praying to God is also in the hands of God. If I want to, if I really um, yearn for God, God will make it possible. If I slip into unconscious at the time of death, um, how can I think of God? I cannot. But it's not that it really much depends on me. It depends on the God will take care of me. That power which has been taking care of me till now, will take care of me at that time too. I'll share with you what, uh, in a words of hope, a very senior monk, the head of our monastery, when I became a monk, he, sh he told me, and these are really great blessing words of hope. So as uh, an over-enthusiastic young novice, uh, after a few days, uh, I said to the, uh, the abbot, the head of the monastery, I don't think I'm making progress. I don't see how I will attain to God realization. You know, the, the way I am going. And you read about all these great swamis and great devotees. And you find yourself so lacking uh, in comparison to them. And he told me something which is so soothing, calming and great blessing. This I will share with you. He said, do not worry. The one who has bought you till now, here. The one who has done all this for you till now. That one will do the rest for you also. Actually put it as a, as a rhetorical question. Will, will he not 
do the rest for you. Where we have come to now, if we really honestly take a look at our lives, whatever little progress we have made in spiritual life, whatever high, uh, good aspirations we have, spiritual aspirations we have, it's not, we have not really generated it ourselves. It has come to us. We, it's not that we have uh, made all this progress ourselves. All the great things in our life, there is there is some other component working behind our efforts. We make efforts, but there is something else there too. So that power will continue to help us until the very culmination of this game of life, not just this life, of all our lives. So with that wonderful prayer, we pray to the Lord to bless us, keep his, her, its hand over us, a hand of blessing over us all the time. Uh, keep us under protection and uh, it's a wonderful life wonderful lives in plural we will see it all through you know uh, under the grace of god and the uh, uh, either best of all things enlightenment here and now in this life or even at the point of death or failing that the bright path the path of the gods devayana the bright uh, course of the sun, <laughs> Uttarayanam, the northern course of the sun, which is all this mentioned, Krishna mentioned here. That will happen to us. Now we know what's going to happen. We can check. Oh, bright being coming here. Check. I, I said, Krishna told me about it. All right. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Sri Ramakrishna Arpanamastu